we, we basically went through the whole mediation thing and then decided that it was going to be, Ian was going to go and I was going to stay. Um, and I thought, right, that's the end of it then. I'll pay him his money. He'll go. And it wasn't. Because I became very angry. I became really sort of bitter about the whole thing. Do you want to introduce this one, man? You, did, you actually did a good job on the last one. <laughs> yeah, the, so, he he had a surprise there. Yeah. Well, didn't he? <laughs> he, he, he? Enthusiasm doesn't come naturally. All right. So he's. <laughs> <laughs> so. You've got to pat him on the back when he, uh, <laughs> when he bigs it up. You've got to give us a little dog treat. I'm sick of dog treat. Just get, just get dancing. Uh, yes, do you want me to introduce director camera? Or? Yeah, go on. Okay. Uh, right, so welcome to another episode of The Tripod. And uh, we've got a very special guest with us today, a former resident of, of our building, but he's moved on to much bigger and better things since then. Uh, so this is Jason Knight, who is the... Founder or co-founder of Blue Kangaroo? Originally the co-founder. Co-founder. Yeah. We, might, we might put a pin in that and come back to that later. Uh, so Kevin and I have known Jason, well, for longer, because we're all in the IBC before. We're 17 here, we? years. 17 years. Yeah. Really? Jeez. 17. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> we, <that's> a, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's just put a damper on things, yeah. isn't it? 17 years. 17 years. No, it's been, uh, it's been very good. We've obviously done lots of projects together over the years. Mm. We've um, been in the same office space and in multiple buildings over the years and uh, always gotten on. And, um, well, frankly, I just know you've got a very interesting story. I've heard you tell part of the story at little events and things in the past, so we're always looking to get someone on to tell us an interesting journey to where you are now. I, I don't want to spoil anything, but obviously you're in a very nice position now. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I think I think you've been you've taken a very uh, unusual path. I think hmm. to get to where you are now. Yeah. So um, so yeah. Welcome to Jason Knight from Blue Kangaroo. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for coming, Jason. Do you want to just talk about where you are now? What what the business yeah. is doing? Um, Blue Kangaroo is a uh, um, a brand and agency, stroke experiential retail. You name it. We've sort of diversified over the past past few years. Um, we're a team of 16 people. We're based in Newcastle. I've uh, been trading for 17 years. Um, and we've, like a lot of businesses, been through the mill. You know, we've been up and down, backwards and forwards. Um, but when we first originally set up, I originally set up, you mentioned there, with Earth, um, had a business partner at the time. Uh, and there was just the two of us. And we used to work out of the uh, Gated International Business Centre. Um, and at the time, we really sort of concentrated on um, local work, council work. And at the time, the government had this scheme where if you were a business, you could get a grant for setting your business up and getting, you know, branding done and video work. Or whatever. We, we tapped into that. We used that through Gator Council yeah. to part fund some of the first equipment yeah. that we bought. Yeah. So that's what we did. And, and you know, it's for a year and a bit, two years, it was okay. It was good. Um, and then we got... Um, we got involved with the Walt Disney Company. So we we used to work for a company in Newcastle, in Gateshead, sorry, um, which is where myself and my ex-business partner had left from. He was a senior designer there and I was a project manager. Um, and we always vowed never to go after his customers because I'm, a, you know, I'm, over the years it's been to my detriment that I'm I'm too honest and I'm too... I've got morals and I stick to them, you know, and that doesn't always go down well in the business world. No. But at the same time, you know, I would rather at the end of all this, people turn around and say, well, actually, he was a decent bloke. Mm -hmm. So we never went after um, this guy's customers. And then we'd worked with Disney previously at this company. Um, and we got the opportunity to speak to somebody at Disney down in London. Um, it was literally a, complete cold corn. I just thought I'll give it a bash one day. So we ran a completely different department, got through, um, and the lady was like, you know, can you send me your portfolio? And I was like, well, I can't do, but it's social housing brochures and all this. So, so um, <laughs> it was, you know, when you get one of them calls, it's just at the right time, right place. Uh, and she basically said, well, I said, can we, can we do a job for you? We'll do it for free. So we won't charge it unless you like it. So, she sent down this project and it was um, to do some Mickey Mouse shaped bread packaging, which we did. Um, 
you know, my, my, my business partner was a good designer. You know, he did some really good work, sent it down there, and that's how we got into the license market. And since then, we work with, and I hate to say this because it makes it sound as really pretentious, but we work <laughs> with the biggest names in the entertainment, toy, retail industries globally. So that's everybody from Walt Disney, Pixar, Lucasfilm, right the way through to Hasbro, Mattel, um, and all the people in between. So, so yeah, that's where we are now. So was it the case of once you got your foot in the door with Disney, that was just a big enough fish where a lot more of that work just kind of fell like dominoes? What, what it was, and this was down to inexperience, we got in with Disney stores, um, and they became the biggest part of our business. Now, the building down at Disney in London used to hold about 5,500 people a Disney store on one floor. And the guy that we work for, um, who we eventually, the lady who we started working with left, new guy took over, and he sort of kept us to himself. So I'd probably say for three or four years, all we did was Disney store work. And, you know, we grew to about four or five people. And it went okay. And at the time, I thought, this is brilliant, you know. Um, and then all of a sudden, he said, right, well, this department's shutting down. You've got a month. And that was it. So that was when we then had to start sort of spreading our wings to find other other customers. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people that watch or listen to this will be thinking, how the hell did he get in with those big brands? Mm -hmm. And you'll answer what, that. What's the magic trick? A cold call. Yeah. Yeah. You just picked up the phone and said, can I, can I speak to you? Yeah. yeah. My, my attitude is, you know, whether, whether you're running a one-man business or a global business, you've got to aim high. So... You know, if you want to be in the licensing world, go to the biggest company in the licensing industry mm -hmm. because they can only say no to you. So then go to the second biggest and then the third biggest and then so on and so on. The fact is for us, we hit the sort of jackpot getting into the biggest business at the time. Um, and we met some amazing people there. You know, and I'm still friends with a lot of them now. They've all gone to different companies. And because we've done such a good job, they've taken us with them, you know. So, you know, somebody I know left Disney um, just after we were told the um, that department was shutting and they went to, um, it was Warner Brothers. And then they rang us and they're like, do you want some work? So we didn't even have a sales department. So over the past 17 years, we've never had a sales team. We've never had a mark. Sorry, we had a sales lady join us. Um which was a mistake because a mistake on my behalf because we brought this lady in and probably didn't brief her properly and didn't, you know, give her the opportunity at the time. Um, but we've never had a sales team. We've never had a marketing team. We've, you know, we've probably in 17 years spent less than 10 grand on marketing. Wow. Wow. Very not impressive. Done, not done anything really. So when you rang Cold Call Disney, then ended up offering them the first project for free. Before you picked up the phone, were you already planning to do that or were you just thinking on your feet once you got the conversation going? No, because I'm a bit of a gobshite. So I'm one of them people that, you know, um, it probably irritates the entire company that we've got that I don't plan for anything really. You know, f for me, it's just a case of, you know, I rang up, spoke to her and it just popped into my head, we'll do the first job for free. And that's worked. We've done that quite a lot through our, our history. You know, because to me, what you got to think about is if I come to you and say, you know, will you give me some design work? You've never met me. You don't know what we do. You don't know if, you're, if we're good or if we're bad. So if I say to you, well, we'll do it for free, the first one, but if you like it, you pay for it, you're not losing anything. You know, all you got to do is say, well, no, I don't like it. That's like any good drug dealer. Yeah, get <laughs> yeah, it's get them hooked and then get them. <laughs> um, and that's the way we've sort of done it the whole time. We're now in a completely different place where, and I would say this, but we're probably the best agency in our industry at what we do. And that's not me bigging it up. It's just, it's a fact. You know, I've surrounded myself with people who are far better than I am at anything in our business. You know, so we've gone from this sort of blagget sort of, design company which actually i quite miss i quite miss the you know the blagging days where you know you really sort of like i remember getting a brief once for a, an exhibition stand it was the first one we did 
and the client told me it was 150 grand and I was like pull up banners you know <laughs> all this so it wasn't it was a proper exhibition stand and we probably made about 500 quid out of it right. because we were completely out of our depth completely blagged it you know but that then set us up onto the next sort of level and now we do we design and build exhibition stands all over the world mm. so I quite miss them days where you know and, and how much uh, shoe leather went into getting the next projects then so once you've built the first one was it a case of people saw it and just said all right well if you did that you can do mine mm -hmm. or were you going to people and saying look what we just did give us a chance to do yours um no we've never really gone out and sold it we've never really gone out and um i'm a great believer in if you do really good work deliver a really good project they'll come back for more now uh, I've got a guy who works for me called Paul Richards, and he's our head of, you, you've met him, yeah, director yeah. of creative strategy. Um, he's the man that's on the journey with me. You know, he's a key part of the business. His standards are up here, like literally up mm -hmm. here. Um, when our creative team first met him, they were in shock because he <laughs> works a completely different way than anybody else. Yeah. But because, even his schedule is totally different, isn't it? Really, he just, he just, yeah, he's, he's a bit of a, he's a bit of an enigma, as Paul. Um, <laughs> but that's then taken us to that next level because it's like you know we design a teacup, and the customer pays for that teacup. What we now do is we'll design the source of the goals with it, the goal just to give them that little bit extra. We've just done a project in London where we designed and built a two hundred square metre retail space in London. You know, there's been, like every project like that, there's been problems along the way, but we'll make sure that the project gets finished. It might cost us, it might mean we've got to do things extra, but we've got to take that problem away from the customer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's that's how we've built our business. We're not in a situation nowadays where you can afford to just knock out a bit of design, send it to them, thanks for the money, and off we go. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can't do that. So how's, sorry... How's the, um, you just tell me a bit more about how the company evolved. So you mentioned it was just the two of you mm -hmm. in the IBC and you said you've surrounded yourself with people that are better than you. Yeah. What's that journey been like? How have you got those people? Where did you find them? Um, so the first big employee that we took on um, was a guy called Craig. Now, Craig. We went to school with Craig. Yeah. We did, yeah. So you know Craig. So Craig came from, um, he was working for a car company at the time doing adverts for cars and stuff so he had no experience within the licensing industry he's an absolute machine of a guy to do work with his quality is brilliant his thinking's brilliant um the way he works and that's sort of he's learned that over the years you know he's learned that through working with other people and he's just he's taken off um, I've got another guy called Ben, who Ben came to us, um, and he was he was still at college, but he wanted to work in an agency one day a week on his day off, and he came in, um, and you know when you just see something in somebody, and mm -hmm. you just think, you know, he's got the right attitude, he's just, and he, he came in and we didn't pay him, you know, because he was just an experienced guy, um, and then when we needed a bit of work doing, a bit of paying work, he got paid a bit, and this sort of Funny enough, we had a lad called Ben, yeah. also, who, very similar situation, got introduced to him <laughs> through a mutual contact, and he was working six days a week at mm. Tesco Opticians, mm. but he was a CG artist, and he was just basically offering himself on his one free day a week yeah. to anyone who wanted, you know, to Listen. try him out, and he yeah. came and did a couple of bits of work for us, helped us win a project by doing some design work, yeah. a bit of storyboard, and we gave him a job. And that, that's exactly what's happened with Ben. So Ben now looks after... You know, people like Disney, you know, Mattel, huge brands. And he's got a team from, and, you know, he's been a real sort of revelation. So we haven't gone out and looked for people in our industry. We've gone out and found people who you can see something in. Hmm. There's a, you know, there's yeah. a spark there. There's, for me, it's more about attitude. Attitude's the most important thing. Whenever I employ somebody, if it's me interviewing them, 
I never look at their qualifications because I haven't got any. So I haven't got a, I haven't got any qualifications. I'm dyslexic. I'm dyspraxic. So you know I've had to wing it. You know, um, so I can't then look at somebody's qualifications and say, oh well, you haven't got a degree in this, so you can't go work for us. Mm-hmm. And that, that's how we've done it. Um, Paul was a customer of ours, so when when me and my business partner split up, um, the writing was on the wall for a little while. You could tell it was. It's like a marriage, isn't it? You know, you're together so long. I don't know, Kev, is it like a marriage? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, dear. <laughs> yeah, but it's like a marriage. So, you know, I could see the writing was on the wall. Um, nothing in particular. It was just, there was just something not going on. Paul was one of our clients who was living in Los Angeles at the time. Um, so I had dinner with him at a place called uh, Redondo Beach, which is really nice. It's a lovely night. Sun was setting looking out over the, the sea. And you pulled out your phone and he said, and you said, said, look at these yeah. pictures of Gateshead, Paul. And I said, uh, if you have fancy coming and working in Gateshead, and he was like, it's Gateshead. Right? And I was like, just like all that. Um, so Paul had a, Paul's family lived in the UK, so he moved back to the UK and then came to work for us. And then that's, you know, sadly, not long after that, me and my business partner went our separate ways. And uh, obviously, you know, feel free to, tell us what you want to tell us but Kevin and I have obviously known each other since we're teenagers worked on projects before we started this business and now we've been business partners for 18 mm. years uh no signs I don't think of any impending business divorce but um if you can explain what, what's it like to go through that because I can't imagine it was uh well you said it's like a marriage is it like a divorce yeah. it, I, I feel it like that. it's it's something that I think you bury your head for a long time to think that it'll go away It'll we'll just the will blow over. Um, it didn't. Um, I had to then say, well, one of us has got to go. It that felt like a massive weight off my shoulders because you know it's like splitting up your girlfriend. You don't want to say it, but someone's got to say it, and yeah. we said it. Um, and it wasn't a nice thing to go through because even though we were. You know, we were never sort of friends outside of work. You know, we knew each other. We got on with each other. We didn't mix outside of work. We didn't, you know. Um, so to turn around and say, you know, potentially I'm going to lose my whole livelihood here because a relationship's not working. So we, we sat and talked about it. Um, I said either you take over the business or I'll take over the business. One of us has got to go. So you're actually, you were personally prepared to walk away mm-hmm. to, to save the business, basically? Yeah, because I, I felt so passionately about Blue Kangaroo. To me, it's, I always call it my Blue Kangaroo family because that's what it is. You know, I've, I work with people who I care about I, from the start to now. Um, you spend a lot of time with these people. You know, I feel responsible. I've seen people like, you know, Andy, who works for us. Andy joined us when he was a young lad. He's... I've watched him have children, not him, his wife. Um, <laughs> now, I've, when you say you've watched yeah, his wife have children. I've, I've, yeah. <laughs> I've, 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 you know, I've seen him him and his family grow. Um, so to sort of have to say goodbye to that was going to be was going to be heartbreaking. But for me, I was more bothered about their their futures. Mm-hmm. You know, so we, we basically went through the whole mediation thing and then decided that it was going to be, Ian was going to go and I was going to stay. Um, and I thought, right, that's the end of it then. I'll pay him his money, he'll go. And it wasn't. Because I became very angry. I became really sort of, I became really sort of bitter about the whole thing because it was splitting my family up. Mm-hmm. And you're now putting me in a position where financially I've got to put everything at risk to pay to pay somebody off. Yeah. Um because it was over a long period of time, was it? it was yeah, over, yeah. yeah, we you know, we agreed, you know, we agreed a payment, which I won't go into the yeah, financial yeah. side of it. We agreed a, a situation. Um and I think the minute I made the first payment, I lost interest straight away. Mm. I just lost interest in the whole thing. And if it wasn't for the team around me who sort of must have seen that what I was like, they stepped up. You mean you lost interest in like actually the work and yeah, the business? It was day to day running the business. It was just, you know, 
Yeah. I You're just, demoralized. Yeah, basically. I was completely demoralized. So I ended up going to see a counselor about the whole thing. Um, and I remember she was a lovely lady, um, really nice lady. Now I mentioned her name, she's called Yalda. And my wife sort of said to us, right, you've got to go and speak to somebody. And I was like, look, I don't need to go and speak to somebody. <laughs> um, and I went to see her and we sat down and she was like, right, what's your problem? Why are you so angry? And I was angry with the world. Um, and I was like, right, first of all, I owe out this much money. And it was a lot of money. Mm. A lot, you know how it was a mm. lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, and it just went on and on and on. So I ended up going to see this lady every week. And then one, one week she said to me, you asked him to leave. Is that right? And I was like, yeah. And she said, uh, you agreed the figure that you would pay him. I was like, yeah. And she says, and you agreed that he couldn't work within the industry for this long of time. And I said, yeah. And she went, so what's your problem? She got you there. And that was, <laughs> and that was like, it's no word of like, that was like, oh yeah. Hmm. yeah. And I sort of walked out of that. After, this would be about 25 sessions in. And I walked out of it and I thought, right, you've got to sort yourself out. So that, that was it. And we just, you know, I sat down with the whole team and said, this is the situation where we are. We've got all this, you know, to sort out. And then COVID hit. And it was like, you couldn't make it up. Mm. You know. Um, and your team have always been, for various reasons, very much office based, like because of the sort of projects you work yeah. on, you have security stuff in place and everything. So it's not an easy switch for you to suddenly go to remote work. And I'm sure we've, we've always worked remotely with regards to our clients because we've got clients all over the world. Yeah. Like, you know, most of our clients at one point were LA based or Florida or wherever. So it was never an issue with the clients, but I struggled. I remember going to the toy fair in Nuremberg, which I've just been to. So I just came back from that and I said to Paul, something not quite right. There wasn't many Chinese exhibitors there. You know, there's just, there was just something not right. So we came back and we, we sort of sent everyone home quite quickly. Cause I thought, you know, the most important thing is people's safety. You know, I've got staff with children. I've got, you know, staff that have got various health issues. So I says, right, everyone, everyone goes home. And I struggled with the whole thing. You know, I'm sitting in the house, you know, and we do like a daily Zoom call. I don't know if you did this, but we do a daily Zoom call. And I'm like, right, is everybody okay? And there was like 10 faces like that. Yeah, yeah. Because nobody knew what to say. Yeah. It was like, you know. Mm. So we got through that and then we, we did use the furlough scheme a little bit, not much. Um, and since then, our business has just gone like that, taken off. Fantastic. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you were just saying before uh, we started recording that um, in your latest studio, it's one kind of like one big room. Yeah. Um, the importance of having like, actually everyone in the same room, so mm -hmm. that, even in the same building, in the same room, so that you can get that sort of collaboration going. Well, you know, for a creative business, you've got to collaborate. Yeah. We also took the decision that we were going to invest heavily in graduates. So we took five young people on who most of them hadn't had any work experience. They would maybe had a little bit of work experience, but, you know, we took on five young people to to join the business because, you know, the average age was probably about 40 odd. You know, we had, we had young, I call her young Joanne. She's in her thirties. <laughs> you know, she was our junior, mm -hmm. not our junior, but in my eyes, she was the youngest. So yeah. it's like, you know, she was always classed as little Joanne or young Joanne or whatever. Um, so we've taken on these graduates and they've done amazing, really good. Mm -hmm. But the problem is they can't learn sitting at home no you know it's not just collaborating it's the office politics it's how a business works it's you know working as a team all this sort of stuff so what we've done is we've moved from where we were we've got a nice office in newcastle again we've doubled our overheads and we're in the office less but we have got certain members of the team who come in every day because mm. that's what they like to do i'm one of them i like to be in the office and then the bare minimum people have to do is two days a week. But if we've got customers coming or if we're doing a project, then they have to be in the whole time. Yeah. So it's quite flexible and adaptable yeah. overall. Yeah. yeah. 
And uh, you, you've just said that you try to be in the office every day, but my experience of you over the years is that maybe 40% of your time is spent traveling. Mm. Um, what, what's that like post COVID? What, what's your typical month look like these days? Um, I'm just getting back into traveling now because, you know, Zoom nobody needs to see you, do they? Yeah. Which doesn't work. Well, no, because I remember you telling me that the thing that you love to do <clears throat> is just when you're in any place, ring up someone that you know there and be like, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm here. Do you want to just get a coffee? Yeah. Don't have to talk about a project. Yeah. And you said more often than not, things come out of that, but it's just about keeping that relationship going. Isn't and that, it? that's you can't do it over right, yeah. So we, um, when we started exporting, um, you've probably heard this story before. When Disney told us they were shutting that department, I thought, you know, we need to find some customers now. So what I did was I emailed people that we'd worked with who I knew were based at Disney in the US. Because like a lot of US businesses, what they'll do is they'll, they'll open an office in London or wherever. When things get quiet or whatever, they shut them and take it all back to America. Yeah. And that's what they sort of did. So I, I was sat one night messaging people on LinkedIn saying, oh, just to let you know, I'm in America next. I'm in LA next week. Any chance I'm popping to you? I had no intention to be in LA. No. You know, absolutely none. Um, and the first guy that messaged back was a guy called Dan Owen, who used to be the head of creative at Disney. And he was like, yeah, I'd love to see you. So, you know, when like, you look at your phone and you think, shit. <laughs> we haven't got much money in the bank and I've got to go to, you know. So within a couple of hours, I made appointments in LA. And literally... It's the best thing I did because went across to see people. You sit in front of them. And then when they say to you, oh, do you know such and such who works on such and such? And you say, no, come on, I'll show you. Yep. And they'll take you around the corner to meet. Can't them. do that on Zoom. No, they'll take you around the corner to meet them. And then they'll say, um, do you know, you know, John or whatever. And I'm like, I'm going to come on, I'll take you to go meet John. So literally what I used to do was make three or four appointments a day. In the end, I would make one appointment at Disney. Get there in the morning, go to my meeting. In the end, you would get shown around here, there, and everywhere. Get to lunchtime, go and see, they've got a Starbucks on their campus. Sit in Starbucks and just sit. And then you'd see somebody come past, you'd say hello. Next thing, off you are again. Mm. Now, that wasn't too, I wasn't going with my portfolio going, what were yeah. you? You know, it was literally, that's that's how we built our US-based business. It's the power of relationships, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. And that's, we. you know, we're back to doing it now. We've just been to Austria to see a customer, to spend a day with them. Um, and it was to sit like this, have a chat, coffee. Show, they were showing us what they were up to. We were telling them what we were up to. You know, see you later. Mm -hmm. And then... And you say we, because now these days, it used to be, again, in my experience, you doing this yeah. all in your own, but yeah. now it's kind of you and Paul kind of sharing that a little bit more. Yeah, we, we, we're much more of a UK-based business now. So most of our clients are in the UK. So Paul has total responsibility for all things creative. And he'll probably watch this and say, yeah, but you're butting. I try not to get involved. You know, I'm trying my best to to sort of sit back and let the team get on because as the business is evolving, I suppose I'm not really keeping up with the creative because I'm, I'm, I'm not creative. I can't draw a straight line with a ruler. Um, <laughs> but I'm always going to want to have me, my, my nose put in and you know, yeah. find out what's going on. So Paul looks after a huge range of clients now. So we haven't both been to the US in probably three years. And we're, we're going to go back this year. Um, but what we do now do is when I went to the client in Austria, I took Wayne, who looks after our 3D, to meet them because it's the client that he does a lot of work with. We then went to Toy Fair in Nuremberg to have a look around, again, for him to get a bit of inspiration. So, you know, we are making the team travel a little bit more. Mm. Um, you know, it all costs extra money, it all, you know, but it's a good investment, you know. Yeah. So that's that's what we're doing now. Mm -hmm. Um you know, what I will say is I'm petrified of flying. So going to I, the US for me was always a... It's funny because um, Kerry did a bit of research and I was reading the notes before this 
And that's the first ad she had it in the notes that you were terrified. Mm. I never knew that. And yeah. I would obviously would never have assumed because all I've ever known is you flying here, there, everywhere. No, no. Again, so, you speak to anybody who travels with me, I'm the worst traveler in the world. <laughs> so how to deal with that? I look out the window the whole way. Mm. If I can see the floor in my head, if I see the clouds go like that, then we're falling. And I think it's a, uh, because I'm not in control. You know, you both own the business. To own a business, you have to be a bit of a control freak. You have to, you know, mm-hmm. whether we like it or not, we are yeah. all sort of control freaks. And I think for me, it's because I'm not in control of something. Um, I'm not scared of the height. You know, yeah. I'm not scared of looking out the window and seeing the floor and everything. It's just because I'm in a, I'm, I'm doing something where I've got no control. Yeah. So if you're in the cockpit, just sitting in the back. If I could see what they were doing, I'd be fine. Yeah. You know, and if you if told me, like, you know, it's bumpy. And I, f- I flew on a flight back from Atlanta once, which um, was bumpy. And the, the, the cabin crew came, and you could obviously see I was, you know, about to burst into tears. Um, <laughs> and he asked me if I was okay, and I was like, I'm just a really nervous flight. And whenever we hit a bump or whatever, he would come back and say, you know, we're passing over some, you know, wind, you know, channels or whatever it is. Um but yeah, if you knew you were a control freak, you would have said, look, what do you want the pilot to do? <laughs> well, that's it. I'll go like, up you know, to and do it yourself. Um, <laughs> but it's it's something, you know, I'm, I'm trying to find coping mechanisms with alcohol. Yeah. Me quite. <laughs> yeah, sleeping pills. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll sleep pills, you name it. I'll tell you what, my wife can get on a plane. She gets on a plane, she pulls the table down, bundles up her jacket, puts it down, and within yeah. a second she's asleep. And I, I just can't do People that. I can't do it. <laughs> Talking a little bit more about how Blue Kangaroo actually approaches projects. So what's like a typical project? What's the starting point? What's the kind of creative process? And it can be anything. So at any one time, I think this morning I looked at the job bag, we've got 127 projects in. So that can be anything from a um, social media piece through to an experiential project where we're about to design, build, and tour, you know, a whole project around the UK. Um, We've split the creative teams into sort of two teams. So we've got, probably three, we've got a team who looks after our main client and they concentrate on that that client. Um, And we've got Ben who looks after that team so Ben Lasky looks after that that team because it's a team that's got um, a lot of moving projects. We've got a young guy, guy called Ben Chick who came in. Ben is um, was one of the juniors, I'll tell you about, who started. Mm-hmm. And he looks after all the social media parts of that project, um, production, all sorts. He's, he's a really good kid and he's picked it up really quickly um, and he runs with everything. So what tends to happen is a project will come in, it'll come in to, to Ben and he'll talk to the other, the two Bens will talk to each other uh, and then they'll determine who in that department's going to work on that project. Mm-hmm. On the other team, we've got um, Craig, who you used to go to school with. Um, we've got another major client who they work with. There's projects coming every day from around Europe Um, Craig oversees that team but within that team we've got two designers who really look after that one client and then that team take on other projects as well so it's a bit of a mix and match Mm -hmm. that team Um, You didn't used to have that setup did you where you had teams dedicated to a certain client what what was it that, that made the change to that? I think it's when you pick up certain clients and the amount of work that they get you know, in the in the past, I remember we used to sit in our Monday morning meeting and we'd have our, you know, if we had 30 jobs on our, I thought this was the, the doc's bollocks here. <laughs> um, and we would sit and go through the jobs and it would get handed, you would get five jobs, you would get five jobs, you would get five jobs. And it just became really messy. When you're looking after one of the biggest toy companies in the world, you've got to have a, de- a dedicated team to look after them because those clients expect looking after they expect it to be at the end of the phone yeah they don't want to ring up and like we used to 
I could answer the phone and tell you about any job we had in that in the business. Now I couldn't tell you hmm. a tenth of what we do. But it's better this way, isn't it? It's much better yeah. because what's happening is it's taking me out of the process and we've got people who are looking after that. And that, that works really, really well. And it's something that I've struggled with because I'm a control freak. <clears throat> um, quite often, if if I'm if I'm running the business and I'm worrying about money or I'm, I'm, I'm just having a genuinely crap week, I'll get an email at the end of the week, just, you know, and it's normally Paul because he can, he, Paul probably knows me better than anybody else. So he'll send me an email and say, just a quick one to let you know, we've done this, 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 and this this week. And I sit there and I think, shit, that's mind blowing. Yeah. For a kid who went to Rutherford Comprehensive School with no qualifications, no, no nothing to be running a business and we're doing this work. It's just, it's just phenomenal. Um, we did a project a couple of years ago, the world's biggest Mickey Mouse jigsaw. You know, it's, it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So, sort of back to your question, how do we approach, it, approach creative projects differently for every customer? Well, with that many different jobs going on at any one time, lots of different types of projects, how do you keep everyone motivated? And kind of, how do you feel confident that you're still approaching everything? Like, I think fresh give people work that they really enjoy. That goes a long way. Mm. The motivation thing is something that worries me because we expect a lot from our team, but we also look after them. You know, they might tell you something different, but, you know, I make sure that they're looked after, you know, whether it's, you know, financially, you know, nights out whatever you know we make sure that we we look after but they work really hard and you can tell when they're getting tired problem is when you've got clients like we've got and you know they're they're really nice clients they're really you know people that we speak to every day who genuinely care but the work can't stop yeah we can't stop an amazon campaign that needs 700 assets you know, because Amazon aren't going to wait. Yeah. Or, you know, we can't design an exhibition stand and then say, listen, all the team's a bit tired, can we have a week off? Mm -hmm. looks, he's building next week. And does that translate into people working all hours? Or, as I suspect, is it more just a case of you've got things well organised? The, the team leads have got things really well organised. Um, again, there's some people in the business work lot, much longer hours than other people do. Um, we don't expect people to work every hour of the day. You know, if I find out people are, then something will be said. Paul's very good at making sure that everybody is, um, is getting the time that they need. But obviously there are times where you have to. Well, doesn't your email signature say something like, um, I'm sending this email at a time that suits me, but I mm. don't expect you to respond to it out of hours kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, I'm, I'm one of them people where I'll sit at 11 o'clock at night checking my emails. Mm -hmm. And if I think of something, I'll send it. But I don't expect you to reply to me. Yeah. It's just... But if, if you've got clients as well in LA, yeah, and just the natural yeah. you know, time zones, they're and, waking yeah. up, and, and like there comes the feedback. Yeah, because basically right. our working day is finishing as theirs beginning. Mm -hmm. So that I know you've talked in the past about how the, you can kind of use that to your advantage. Yeah, because you, you get a much longer day, working day. Um but you know, we we can't take advantage of stuff. No, you know, you can't you can't do that. You know, when when our staff work from home, I never ask them what time they start. I never ask them what time they're finishing. You know, they don't even when they come into the office, they haven't got to be in for nine o'clock or whatever. It's when they come in and when they go home. We're a, we're a um, a deadlines based company. If we miss them deadlines, then that's when we've got an issue. Because, you know, we know that we've got to hit that deadline. You know, there are times where we'll go back to the customer and say, we can't, we can't hit that deadline. But, you know, I think the more freedom you give the team, the better you get, you get the response. Yeah. So what's, um, what's been the favorite, your favorite project that you've done and why? It's 
difficult one, that. I'm, I'm more from a production background, so I like to see something designed and then go off and build it. Mm-hmm. Um, I would probably say the exhibition stands are, are, are my favourite because, you know, you see you see one of the team conceptualise something. Um, or we've, we've just done a, a – in fact, I tell you, we've just done a summer road show last year. Uh, we built a Hot Wheels van and a Barbie van. Um, my favourite and my least favourite project, all in the same thing. <laughs> Because what's really good is when, from my side, is when a designer comes to you and says, right, we've designed that, that's what we want. And then when we go off and build it and you get the visuals and you look at it and you say, that's spot on, that is that is really good. The problem you've got is things go wrong, things get stolen, you know, things don't go to plan. Um, but I wouldn't say I've got a favour. I think it's just anything where we're building something. Yeah. Well, what what do you? What gives you the most satisfaction these days? Because you've obviously from day one been leading the charge on strategy, mm. um, <clears throat> and therefore always been somewhat removed from the production by the sounds of it. So, is it looking at the pipeline and going, we've got this amount of projects in and I can see the next six months, or is it going, that's just a great bit of work? Like what actually gives you personally the most satisfaction? What gives me the most satisfaction is that we employ an amazing team and every month we pay their wages. Fair enough. Yeah. That's that to me is all that matters. You know, there's, there's a lot of stress in between, but as long as we can pay everyone's wages at the end of the month, everything else is, I wouldn't say insignificant, but you know, we've we've been going seventeen years, we've never missed one one wage for anybody. Mm-hmm. Um and yeah, I like to see the work. I do like to see things. I love to you know, I love to go somewhere and see something and think we did that. Mm-hmm. Or I like to go to I like to go to meetings and when somebody in fact I'll tell you what I like, somebody sent us a project recently and inside it they had a page which was like their the top the top projects that are out there at the moment. And one of them was ours. And I thought they are. So you're setting your benchmark on what the team at Blue Kangaroo have done. So I, I suppose it's a bit like a you know, I'm the dad of the family and I'm proud of all my everybody within the family. Yeah. So when I see something they've done or as a business we've done, um the money side of it. You know, if we didn't have to have money, I wouldn't be bothered. Yeah. If I didn't have to pay bills, then it's, you know, um, I'm not a financially orientated person. You know, don't get me wrong, it's nice that we're, we're doubling our turnover or we're doing whatever, but the money's not really the, the driving force behind yeah. it. Yeah. That's fair enough. Um, well, we'll start to wrap things up now. Um, I wanted to go back to what you just touched on earlier because about you and school, so your younger yeah. days. Um, I suggested you for this podcast based on, I think it was a LinkedIn post that you did. Right. Where you basically talked about your background and you were kind of saying, how the hell did I get here? Because <laughs> yeah. I haven't even talked about it, but the army was in the mix as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, because a few of the podcasts we've done have been uh, focused on younger people and how they think about how they're getting in, into mm. the industry. And I think there's a lot of pressure on young people these days, about specifically about education. Yeah. And basically like, you know, potentially thinking their life's over if they don't get good GCSE yeah. results or whatever it is. So do you want to just go into that, into your background, how you kind of so I'll tell you what the I'll, IBC? I'll start from school. So I went to school. Um, as I say, I was a class joke, so I didn't didn't do any, you know, exams were really a bit of a, a bit of a pain, so I didn't bother really calling. Um, <laughs> my parents, as much as they loved me, weren't educationally, you know, stuff. so I decided to join the army. But the problem was I had asthma uh, and I was thick. So my dad knew the recruitment <laughs> sergeant. So he took me down to the um, Army Careers Office. Um, I failed the medical because I had asthma and I failed the entrance exam. But because my dad knew the recruitment sergeant, I joined the Royal Signals, which is one of the hardest regiments to get into. Um, so I just sort of blagged it through the Army, uh, came out of the Army, blagged it through loads of jobs. I was a sales rep for printing companies got sacked more times than than anything. Um, but I, I sort of talked a good job. 
and I talked and was confident in what I was doing. Then went to work for um, a company called Beacon, where, you know, um, there's a project manager where I met Ian, um, and just thought, I could do this. And it was really sort of, you know, I, I yeah. could sort of do this. Uh, I had three small children. My wife was at university doing a dissertation because she was becoming a midwife. And I said, thinking about setting up a business, I bear in mind, I couldn't save money to save my life. You know, it was always skin. So she said, right, promise me that you won't do it until I've got a job. So I was like, of course I won't. Went to work the following day, handed my note, <laughs> came home and said, right, we're doing it. So I never let the education bit bother me until recently. It's only recently that it started to, to sort of bother me that I should redo something. And I'm, I'm intending on doing some course just to get one qualification, just to say. Oh, Why that? Why? It's just, it's just my confidence as I'm getting older is, you know, like I'm, I'm going to um, Newcastle University on Friday to speak to MBA students. You know, I should be going to doing that. You know. So. <laughs> well, well, I, I disagree. I mean, <clears throat> You know, we, we've talked about this on, on other podcasts. We've interviewed Callum, who joined us. And, mm. you know, you said some stuff earlier that absolutely mirrors what we feel, which is, at the end of the day, it's about attitude. The talent, obviously, is a part of it. But if they come in with the right talent or enough talent that you can nurture and the right attitude, mm. that's what we're looking for. It doesn't matter necessarily what qualifications they've got. And therefore, you know, the, you've proven that you've that you've you, you've earned the right to stand in front of people and say this is what I've done and you know he has my experience effectively take it or leave it the fact that the people you'd be speaking to have chosen to go through an educational path that's yeah. fine but uh, but you, you've you've earned the right to stand in front I, of them I think the problem with, with young people nowadays is the pressure on them so so much different than it was when I was younger you know now it's all about likes and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and and all this sort of stuff. And um, paying tens of thousands of pounds to get the education yeah, at the university. Really the pressure. I've, got, I've got a son at the moment who's at university. You know, and I've pushed my kids into education because I don't want them having to struggle like I struggle to get to where I've got to. Um, but I haven't got to where I've got to by myself. I've got there by my wife supporting me, my family helping me. You know, everybody... And I'm, unfortunately, I'm one of them people when somebody says you can't do something, I'm like, really? I'll go out and wait. You know, I'll, I'll go out and wait 100 miles to prove the rock that I can, I can do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but one, one of the things that I really want to do is support young people who haven't got the opportunity, who, for whatever reason, might not have the family who are there to support them, who might not just not got the opportunities in the world. Well, you are mentoring some people. Yeah, I mentor some young people and I really enjoy that. And I really, you know, enjoy seeing, you know, somebody blossom, somebody, you know, it, you know, what, what might be our aspiration compared to their aspirations, completely different. You know, I did some work with Gates at college a few years ago and there was a young girl and all she wanted to do was work in the bank. That was a dream to work now, that was a really easy fix. You know, I rang up somebody that I knew from Barclays Bank, said, can she come and see you? They went to see her. She got an apprenticeship. You know, so if, if as business owners or as senior managers in business or, or whoever, if we can all spend that little bit of time, you know, just to put a bit back into, you know, whether it be the colleges, the community, work experience or whatever, then it'd be a much better place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it also links back to, I suppose, weirdly, what you're talking about, about your experience of going to Disney. Um, if you connect with the right people and you're in the right place at the right time with them, they will open more doors for you, introduce you to more people. You know, it, that that's that's the currency more than anything else, isn't it? It's a, it is relationships. Yeah, it's, it's all about relationships and all about, you know, I might know somebody who, who you might know who I can help you do that. You know, I'm I'm the same with our suppliers. It's not just a young person thing, you know. We'd be in a much better world if we all just helped each other. Yeah. You know, if we all just said, listen, rather than, you know, we've got a competitor who um, I'll quite happily ring up and say, there's a job on the go. We haven't got capacity. Do you want it? 
Now, most people would think you're stupid doing that because they're your competitors. But, you know, are we not better off sort of... I think that's one of the chapters in uh, Art of War, isn't it? Probably is, yeah. Well, probably is, but yeah. I say, I'm, I just, how to mess with your competitors' minds by yeah, being nice to yeah, them? You know, but I just think it's you know I met him, I met them in uh, Nuremberg last week, and I says, why don't we meet for coffee and see how we can, you know? Are, uh, they, are they based up here as well? They're based in Newcastle. Oh, okay, they're, yeah, they're a really good design company. Um, you know why? Why not? Oh, yeah. Rather than do all this, well, well, absolutely. Say, you know, well, we can't do it. Can you do it? Yeah. yeah, well, well, as you, as you probably know, Mark joined us just over two years ago, um, became you know a, an equal partner in the business, and obviously things have worked out even better than we could have hoped mm. at that point. But that all came from, technically, we were competitors, mm. local competitors, but much much like you, I like to just get around and catch up with people, and you know, going back a few years, we're maybe once every six months, he and I would just get together for a coffee or a bit of breakfast or something before work and just, you know just chat about stuff and you know yes we were competing on paper but it was it was what was more interesting was we're often feeling some of the same pain points or in some cases he was feeling some pain points that maybe we'd already been through yeah. and conversation went from there and then you start you know you, you see an opportunity to collaborate on something and then that turns into something else and we, we literally wouldn't be wouldn't be the business we are now if i hadn't been effectively engaging with a competitor a few years ago well i, I, I mentored a young lad called robert bedford down in middlesbrough it's a company called Juiced, um, and he set up literally as the pandemic hit. He couldn't have started at the worst time. He wasn't a restaurant business, was he? No, it was a design company. <laughs> okay. Um, and I, I had some calls with him and everything, and, you know, because I'm, a, I'm a, an export ambassador for the Department for International Trade, so mm-hmm. I also try and help other companies want to export. Um, and I was chatting away to him, and over a period of time, um, it was just a phone call here, phone call there, he would ring up and say, I'm struggling today, can you have a chat with us? And we'd talk. Um, he rang me about three months ago and said, uh, just so you know, I've just won a contract with Funko. Oh, wow. Now, I could have easily sat there and thought, pardon my language, you little shit. You've gone <laughs> after companies in our industry. We don't work with Funko. But I could have easily thought that. But actually, I felt really proud. Mm-hmm. You know, he's, he's working hard. He's gone out and he's got a bit more business mm-hmm. and more importantly he's brought it back to the northeast yeah because you know the, the better we keep the work away from the south the better <laughs> yeah yeah and there's a nice place to end it I think. Yeah. <laughs> perfect well yeah northeast thanks. solidarity <laughs> uh yeah thanks for coming on jason pleasure yeah, really appreciate, appreciate it really really enjoyed enjoyed that. um do you want to do the outro as well because i think oh, i feel no. like you're on a roll here am i really yeah, well, you know what this is You're about. This, this is this is because what he wants us to do is look straight down the lens and go. Remember to smash that like button and that subscribe <laughs> button. That like button. You can't just click it; you've got to smash it. But yes, this has been uh, the the tripod. This has been Jason Nice. Thanks for coming, Jason. And uh, I'm sure there's been uh, plenty in there to enjoy. I thought, always got to catch up with you. And always, uh, you. just interesting to hear your your backstory. You know, you're, you're clearly um, one of the success stories in the northeast i know you wouldn't say that but i'll sit here and say it Thank so you. thanks for thanks for coming along today and being a guest yeah thanks, thanks for everyone Bye. Bye.